Uh, okay, so I think we should start. Um, okay, so today we have this uh, doc to walk through and uh, uh, about the format of the call, uh, we will just uh, go through this document, uh, take some breaks for discussion and so forth. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I would like to like uh, directly edit and add uh, more inf info to these uh, documents uh, right away. Um, so let's just if if there will be like a rough consensus around some stuff that is not an option or won't be won't go to a standard uh, of the API eventually, so we will just uh, make uh, the comment and uh, drop it. Uh, the the more important part I think would be to get more input uh, on uh, some stuff that is missed here that might be missed here, like sync uh, process. Uh, we will stop for it in the middle. Um, I guess sync is not like explicitly mentioned here as a section. Uh, yeah, so, but it should be, I guess. Um, yeah, for, yeah, that's that's like the intro I'd like. To, ah, yeah, yeah, you please don't hesitate to stop me at any point to make a comment or ask a question. Um, if anyone uh, raises hand, I might not see it in time. So just break me and, yep. uh, and uh, go ahead with your stuff. Um, so let's let's start. Uh, any any questions? I guess things clear. So I'm turning on this edit mode. Um, and yep. thanks everyone for coming. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, Glad to see you here, everyone. So uh, the first thing we will start from is the title. Uh, there have been a discussion in the um, Discord and all Core Devs uh, channel. So to I think we should do this, uh, like rename um, this API to the Engine API. So the reason behind this is that we um, we have the Consensus API, uh, which is the uh, the API of the uh, that is exposed by the software on the consensus layer, which is the beacon node API, uh, which is the users and validator clients. We also have the execution layer API, uh, which is the Ethereum JSON RPC. It has uh, several name namespaces. Uh, we are not about to re rename those namespaces. But in general, this is going to be like referred by the execution API, and uh, um, yeah, we have something in 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 between uh, the, the, those two layers, which is more specific to developers uh, than users, and uh, like engine. I think it's a reasonable um, uh, choice here to avoid uh, to avoid the confusion and. Uh, also, engine is a bit uh, confusing because, uh, uh, like, client developers may say that they have the consensus engine in their architecture design, and they have this execution engine, uh, but uh, it's less uh, like you know, confusing than the other choice that we might uh, uh, might. The have. alternative is maybe execution engine API, engine API for short, like the namespace, but then that kind of has a conflict with the execution API. Right, uh, so do we, does anybody oppose to uh, start uh, using this term uh, in application to the set of methods that uh, is exp uh, explained in this doc and that will go to the standard? Can um, you drop a link to this page in the chat? To this, yeah, it's already there. No, oh, that I missed it. Sorry. It depends on when you join on whether you can see it. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. Thanks, mommy. Looks like I, I got one from someone. Okay, so I think we are good with this name, and let's, let's move on. Um, yeah. Okay, so we are. Uh, this is the design space. Uh, we will uh, shape shape it, add more stuff, remove some stuff. Um, okay, so in. Um, yeah, we are. We want to reuse as much of existing JSON RPC implementation, uh, which is obvious. Yeah. 
like the reason behind this. The security of this API is critical and it's been agreed that it will be exposed on the um, independent port. Uh, I don't think we should stop here for any discussion. Uh, also, we are picking up the new namespace name um, and we keep this uh, idea that uh, was uh, proposed by Proto to try to reuse the set of methods uh, for uh, the execution client uh, try to use them uh, on on the uh, layer two solutions in the rollups in the uh, clients that will uh, uh, in, in the software that will be used to run those rollups. So, but anyway, the um, layer one first, uh, and uh, what we can uh, unify and what we can reuse on layer two, um, yeah, will be like uh, figured out, and yeah, we but let's keep it in mind. I think it's pretty reasonable. Um, <sighs> okay, so the encoding part, I don't think we should stop here. Uh, it's just, you will use the, it, it follows this uh, like uh, logic. So let's reuse as much of the existing JSON RPC as we can. So we'll use the encoding that is used by JSON RPC. It might be convenient to some uh, places, um, like, but anyway, uh, it's, we have libraries, we have uh, like uh, implementations uh, to handle this. Uh, so yeah, encoding is here. So the minimal set of methods, um, it's been derived and a bit extended and modified from what we uh, had uh, in the, in, during the Iranism. Um, so let's uh, move through all of them. So there is the assemble payload, uh, just the new name. Uh, I think the payload is more specific and more uh, like sound uh, to what we have. Uh, so it just builds the payload and returns it back to, to the consensus client. Uh, so the, the addition here is uh, from previous generation, uh, the random, uh, but it's, yeah, it's just passing the uh, rendal makes to, to the, um, execution engine to embed it into the block. Uh, there will be a corresponding EIP uh, to describe the specification on the execution layer side about this. Uh, and what, what was added recently is the coin base. Um, there, there are comments and uh, there is the, like a kind of proposition what was exp um, exposed by Micah. Uh, sorry, Martin. Yes. Um... So regarding this method, the sample payload, which I understand to be basically, please collate the block for me and put together transactions. Um, the way it works now in ETH1 is that and as soon as we have a new head, we want to start mining immediately. So we start working on the, on the empty uh, block. Uh, then while that is happening, the client is actually trying to find the best transactions. And for MEV, yes, I'm, I mean, they're working on finding the best set of, of uh, sequences of, uh, you know, these bundles. Um, and they keep working on it and improving it and from time to time updating uh, the work package. And I'm thinking if... Having just uh, one method called assemble payload might not really cover. Then it it leads to the situation that the the um, two sorry for using the term uh, client calls the consensus API and it, it needs to make a subjective like decision. Can I spend one hundred milliseconds on it? Can I spend two hundred? Can I spend two seconds on it? Uh, so I'm thinking it might be better to um, first tell the consensus layer, here's the latest tip. Uh, and yes, you are the one who is, I'm going to ask you to deliver a new block on top of this uh, in a little while. Uh, because I think we know that when we, when we have the new block that the next one will be our slot. Um, and then later on, we, we, the, the 2.0 client can, could ask like, could you give me the, the new payload now? um for the block that i already told you to start working on and something like that maybe a bit more i don't know some, some kind of interactiveness mm -hmm. um, I think, might be 
if I understand what you're saying yeah. correctly, you basically have uh, two points in time. One, which is when the consensus client knows all the information that will go into the next block, but it's not the last point in time where it's reasonable to receive it. And then you have another point in time later where it's like, okay, now is the last chance to give me a block, right? Mm, I don't think that was quite what I meant. What I mean is like, if we're given a one-off chance to produce a block on top of some other random block, there's going to be like a startup cost to, to just, you know, figure out right. and get the state in order and stuff. And then, then there's this iterative process. What, uh, what transactions should I fit it with? And if we want to, you know, if, if the most pressing issue is that, no, we need to deliver something now then obviously we need to, we're going to deliver a, an empty set of transactions. Um, right. So I guess what I'm thinking is, is we have that set of details. We can't start building the final block until we have those like four things, right? The parent hash, timestamp, the random, and the Coinbase. Um, Coinbase, presumably you might know long in advance, but like the timestamp and the parent hash, or well, the parent hash definitely you don't know until some short period of time right no, before it's no. your turn to build the block, you, right? You know, because it's relative to the slot. It has to be fixed to the slot. It's a function of the slot. And the, you know, the you know you're going, uh, sorry, but the parent hash, you know, is, is going to be from the prior slot. So you have, you know, the block is coming in, attestations are coming in, likely in the mm -hmm. four to six second time frame uh, of the prior slot, you know, certainly, you know, without, in, in right. almost all so, cases but, that you're going to propose. So you have that information. So I, I, my, my gut here is maybe you have um, the method that doesn't instantaneous like get block, which is like the very basic method. And then you have, you know, an alternative optional method where you can pretty much signal start work. Um, and then if you signaled start work before, you're going to get a better block when you call get block. And if you call get block without having done that or prepare block, yeah. Um, then you're going to get something more instantaneous, uh, or or a client underneath the hood could leverage that they're always trying to make a block from the previous tip uh, and not leverage that extra method. But the extra method maybe is, is you know is an optimization. Uh, yeah, and do does the is this optimization really critical? Because uh, I don't know. As for me, the strategy when the consensus client just starts to. Uh, call the assembled payload in advance and calling like several times and fix the latest uh, block that it got from the execution client when the, when it is time to propose the block. Uh, since okay, like so you're saying the alternative could be, and I think we had this conversation many months ago, the alternative could be once I know I'm going to want a block, I just call a symbol block over and over again. And the execution engine knows that it should keep trying to make a better block because you might call it again. Yeah, it just makes a block. Uh, so it, it makes it uh, by, by app on request. So it's pretty simple for execution client to decide. So it received the message. How resource intensive is it to try and build that optimal set of transactions? So it, it, there will always be improvements that can be made because the pending pool is constantly changing. And so even you know in the last millisecond, you can get a new transaction in that totally changes what the optimal block is. And so the optimal strategy for a block preparer or block builder is to always try to build a better block every opportunity you get. So as fast as you can, you build better and better blocks. Um, and as soon as long as transactions continue to come in, which is basically always happens, um, there will always be some improvement you can make. And and just um, one more note. So Mikael, you mentioned that the it sounded like you meant that the this method could be called multiple times and we could get incrementally better. Uh, but that means, well, how should the execution layer know that? Okay, I can stop. I can stop working on this now because sufficiently after timestamp. <laughs> It, it may finish like the work on, on past, right? Yeah, it may finish like this work on. Uh, I mean, each request will have a corresponding response. If it's not requested, the block is not being built. Right, but if it's if the working is scoped to the to the lifetime of the RPC request, then you're saying it should not continue working after the RPC request ends. I thought you meant it would. 
Right. So uh, actually we had this conversation with Peter months ago and the, the answer that we had come up with then, and I think there's two sufficient answers. One is that you do an explicit prepare and then you get it when you want it. And then the other is you call a symbol payload whenever you're ready and you get, you get a response, but timestamp is in fact in the future. Timestamp is the slot that you're going to propose at, um, which is either immediately now um, or is, you know, four seconds, six seconds lead time because you know you're about to go. So if you call it and there's a six seconds lead time, you could on the execution layer know that timestamp's still in the future and they're likely to call this again. Um, and so that could be your signal to continue to do work and or not. Um, so I think you can you can either leverage this method that way or you can do an explicit prepare and then a, and then a get. Yeah, and now I get what uh, what two alternatives do we have? So uh, one is the um, execution client is responsible for building these blocks and storing them, and re returning uh, the one uh, that is latest upon re upon additional request, or we move this responsibility to the consensus client, which will do do the same actually. Uh, and uh, I think if we have this functionality already implemented in the execution client, it makes sense to keep it there and just provide this additional method. That was what was suggested by Martin, right? Yeah, and, and Martin, there's a desire. So there's a functionality to kind of always be building the best block, but because we now know if we're going to actually want the best block soon, then we might as well not always be building the best block and instead on demand be building the best block, right? Because you could just keep it as is and just always be working on a pending block, right? Does, am I correct in understanding that the consensus client has a single point in time where they submit a single block to the network and they will never submit a second one, is that correct? Correct, for that slot, for that um, assignment. Right, right. So, so there is, at least the consensus client knows like now is the last chance for a block, Correct. right? Um, the, how much um, like latency is acceptable there for that communication? So like between the time the Clinton's client says, okay, like I, I want to submit a block to the network right now. Um, if it takes 200 milliseconds to actually get that response from the execution engine, is that okay? Or is that gonna be a problem? Is it okay for two seconds? better off broadcasting immediately at the start of the slot rather than like starting to do their work at the start of the slot. Um, okay, so uh, the incentives the, are such that that you know they, they what have you need to be preparing, so you should be preparing and then just actually get it out on time. Got just, and that timestamp is... I think, I think the, the prepare payload plus get payload is a lot clearer because it means, you know, prepare, you can start building right. and get payload that is you just deliver what you have and if we have just assemble payload then it will be this you know um right uh, trying to measure how long have i spent time doing this oh should i deliver now can i wait another 50 minutes seconds blah 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 which it's i just, yeah i think i agree it, 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 it adds some statefulness here but it as long as get payload can be operated without statefulness um you know it, without a previous prepare and it would just give you something very quickly. I think that that's a reasonable trade-off between statefulness and not. Yeah, and also one question here. Uh, well, how do the, uh, like, the client decide when to like stop building one block? Or it's just constantly, if it see one more transaction, it will like build uh, yet another block and so forth. As long as you haven't done a get for the prepare, then it would continue to try to build. Right, so the uh, it's like uh, up to one transaction. Am I right? I mean, to yeah, it should be relatively cheap to execute one transaction on top. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that's how often the block is the new version of the block is being built. That's like my question. Question. So, are in, you, are in you talking about every three seconds? Uh, if we send this prepare payload. How often uh, will uh, the block is being uh, will the new version of the block uh, is being built by the execution client? So, what is the condition here to start building a new one? More of a modified this, one, if I understand correctly. 
is this so like the on... new transaction arrives and uh, the new block is built at the, like with a new set of transactions? Yeah, so it depends on the particular miner. Um, each, all the miners have different strategies. I believe, and Martin can correct me if I'm wrong here, that Geth just every three seconds builds a new one while, their, while proof of work is being worked on, like somewhere else. Um, if you're running like MEV Geth or something, though, um, it's depend again, depends on the particular miner, but there are miners out there that are building constantly. Um, there, if this MEV new block stuff that they're working on, um, you're actually getting full blocks from third parties that you then compare against the existing block you got from some third party. Um, so I think from a design standpoint, we should assume that blocks are basically being constantly produced at maximal velocity through some potentially distributed network um, on the back end. So from the consensus client's perspective, you know that you know on the other side of this API, some amount of work is continuing to be done just until you, we call it assemble block. And someone's working real hard <laughs> back there um, is what I recommend designing around. Yeah, I think we should expect yes, I innovation think, I mean, on that layer. Even regardless, regardless of exactly how get page right now, I think Mika, Mika, you're that's the right model to have. Agreed. Yeah, so that was the reason kind of my question that we might want to have like a new strategy uh, in the proof of stake uh, world. I mean, for building a block, for updating a block. Okay. So cool. the, the consensus engine, if I understand correctly, doesn't actually care about any of those intermediate blocks, right? They only compare, care about the very last one. And right. not, they don't need right. to pull in between because they know exactly when they want to get the final result or the best result. Right. Like, I, I so would say that like three seconds might uh, be a good uh, a good one for proof of work, but uh, yeah, with the 13 seconds per block, but here we have much less, uh, like twice as less. Right, and in MEV Geth, they're potentially not even following the same strategy. So I think you, you should expect kind of a lot of innovation on the layer and expect potentially continuous work. Continuous cool. and distributed. I think that's that's key to keep in mind. Like the thing you're talking to, the execution client you're talking to, may just validate the block at the end. Like they might not actually be building the block. They may have this work farmed out to third parties. Yeah, I, I suggest we will... oh, Okay. Yep. Sure. So the the Coinbase argument is it possible to have it? only as a hint, so validator can uh, suggest the Coinbase, but the execution engine can decide to suggest different Coinbase. Like I'm thinking about all the scenarios where we don't have a matching one-to-one -one between the validator, like Beacon Chain and the Ethereum one operator, but some, some scenarios where you have market where the uh, block builders are independent and can decide to have different strategy of Coinbase and splitting the cash flows of the transaction fees and the, uh, and the rewards. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it should be an option for overriding the Coinbase and or like not doing the override. I mean, the option in the command line interface for the execution client. So which will explicitly say that the Coinbase will be overridden, even though it's sent over this uh, method. Uh, it will be overridden by the following address when you run this node. So if you need this set up, I don't know if it's even appropriate to override it, uh, but probably in some cases it, it is necessary to have this uh, kind of option. But I think it was, I think his question was in the other direction because you're saying there may be a default Coinbase in the execution engine and this will override. He was saying that the execution engine could say, I'm not gonna listen to you and use my own, um, which I don't think should be, it should be designed in that scenario. Um, and I would, I would have thought that it was optional in both directions, that it's reasonable for someone running an execution engine to say, actually, no, nah, I'm, I'm owning the Coinbase. I want these rewards because I'm running the engine. I'm paying the costs for this. It's also reasonable for a beacon node to not know what the Coinbase should be so it doesn't supply one and, and expects the execution engine will provide a default. Um, I'm not strong on that, but it seems to provide the flexibility that that kind of makes sense in, in terms of working through the use cases. I think that um, in a world in which we have a proof of custody for the execution of, the, uh, of that layer, that 
you essentially like the execution engine cannot be outsourced at that point and uh it needs to listen to what the directives are and that if a market is dictating that uh if the market maker is dictating that they can set their own coin base and that you know that needs to be negotiated beforehand rather than uh not listened to at that point um i just i don't think it's very clear uh but there's a lot of active research working on making sure that you can't outsource execution like this and that you actually as a validator need to execute um even if somebody else is providing the payloads um and so i think yeah, we so need think, to consider that in the design i think the last thing you said is, is critical there the we definitely want to prevent people from outsourcing execution clients. But I don't think that means we care about people outsourcing block production. And the sure. Coinbase reward may make total sense to go to the block producer and not to... Um, I agree, but the, the, model. the consensus layer needs to... Like the consensus client needs to have actually known that they're entering into a market like that because it cannot validate like if, if it thinks that it's providing a coinbase where fees are going to go to it can't it won't validate whether that information was actually respected or not so i think that the it's it's very strange oh, for the saying. consensus layer to yeah. think i'm going to get these fees and then pass it along and then not have actually gotten it even if it's doing all the execution and stuff whereas i think if you were entering into a market where like that would be bypassed, then you you should have configured your system in that, in such a way. Um, so th the problem there is that means that we need to know, um, like we'd have to negotiate the coin base before we produce a block where we don't produce the block. Like if we're doing a market for block production, the block producers are coming from all over and you don't know what the coin base is going to be until after the block is produced. Like we have an order there that's going to cause problems, I think. Right, so maybe Coinbase should be a configuration. Is it requisite that builders use Coinbase to actually pay? Is there something there? Like, because um, you want to be able to make no, your I mean, gener your block generic too? I, I think there, there's some like economic arguments of, you know, we want to encourage in theory if your ETH to actually be used for payments for transaction fees and um, Coinbase kind of helps nudge people in that direction, um, doesn't enforce it. Um, there's also like, because there's a Coinbase opcode, it gives people submitting transactions um, a way to pay the block builder. And so it gives a, an auditable trail of, of payments from the right. people who are submitting transactions. So you don't end up with like uh, layer two payments or some off ch other channel payments for this stuff. Again, th these aren't super strong arguments, like they're not deal breakers, but it just helps with transparency and stuff like that. So let me see. Uh... It's untenable for block builders to wait for prepare block before knowing Coinbase address. Why is that the case? So if the if you have someone submitting a transaction and they want to um, bribe the person who is constructing a block, they need to send money to Coinbase via either via gas fees or via in a transaction they do you know Coinbase dot transfer or Coinbase dot call or whatever. Um, and so. They don't know who that who's that's going to be if you have a market for block builders. So you might submit your transaction out to a dozen block builders, and they're all competing with each other to try to build the most profitable block for the um, block for the execution client or for whoever's slot right. is up, right? Um, but they want the people who are submitting transactions to pay them because they're the ones who are need to be incentivized to sort their transactions appropriately. And so we we it's possible to you know have other ways of paying those block builders. It just you lose transparency if you move it off to another layer. Can the uh, can the consensus engine validate the the Coinbase? That's part of the block header, right? Yeah. I so they, it seems like they, they could. They, they could validate it, but I think probably the more important question is, what are they going to do about it? They've got two choices. They can either give up all their rewards and ditch the block, or they can accept it and publish it and get you know, the rewards on the beacon chain yeah. and go up the Coinbase. They're going to accept it. Uh, they may publish MP well, payload uh, as well. Like the block with MP payload. So yeah, I, I guess that's that probably actually I don't know. I see the markets where the, uh, the consensus engine actually speaks to multiple execution engines and then um, allows them to select Coinbase and may have its own execution engine that it relies on as a last resort one uh, where it knows that the Coinbase will be agreed on. So, and then it can select of which one is the most but, favorable 
for the validator. I think that's conflating this like block builder separation from like the validator actually executing things, which in a world in which you have a proof of custody on the execution layer, the validator is going to have, ex have to execute things. And so the fact that you got, if and how you got a block from somebody and how it's paid for is kind of an independent thing. And I, I don't think that we should have this like superposition where you're asking, <clears throat> you don't know if the coin base is gonna be set even though you're going to still need to execute, but uh, so are, are we we're assuming conflating that multiple the, conversations at this point. Are we, are we assuming that the consensus engine and the execution engine are a uh, trusted relationship? Or are we assuming they're- I'm end? arguing that that will certainly be the case because it is a security flaw for it not to be. Um, and there, okay. there's so, going to be a push in R&D to make that the case over time that if you're running, if you're if you're running a beacon node and a validator, you have to actually literally do the execution, um, even if you outsourced block production or block building. So, in that case, I feel like we could just say that the Coinbase is a recommendation, or it's like a just a place to put the Coinbase, and then it's up to individual operators to decide: Do I want my validator node to decide the Coinbase, or do I want the execution engine to decide the Coinbase? And so, this is basically a, sure. a, a way to Facilitate, facilitate that communication, but we don't have to like enforce that in any way. We can just say, you know, it, it's up to individual operators to decide which side um, decides the final coin base. Here's a mode for communicating that information between the two in case you decide you want to go with the model where your consensus engine is the one that makes the suggestion. Right, I, I think that's reasonable. There are options here and there. And it means that we, uh, like for the standard, it would mean that we uh, will use like not must set the Coinbase uh, wording, but should or like with the note with the uh, notion that it may be overridden. I don't know by the execution client. And Tomas, so the the what I'm arguing is that your execution engine might ask many market sources for a valuable payload but then your execution engine ultimately is going to run it. And it needs to be configured to decide if it was happy with the setting of the Coinbase or not, um, rather than the consensus layer talking to 10 different execution engines. You know, I think you have consensus layer execution engine and then a market for execution engine. And, and those are three different things rather than conflating execution engines as the market providers. Oh yeah, I, I just used it as a shortcut so you can have an execution engine, which is like an aggregator of execution engines, but in the end, architecturally, it will still be talking to the consensus layer. And if our consensus layer, it will be transparent. However, if we remove this ability to upgrade the Coinbase, then the aggregating execution engine cannot really rely on multiple ones. Um, it can cannot even allow them to uh, to act independently upfront and try to construct different blocks. And it actually, what's cool about it is it's a bit more uh, friendly for multiple solo execution engine validators runners. So for solo validators, it might be harder to extract the MEV, so to create very efficient execution engines, but they always want to make sure that they don't publish incorrect ones. So they'll run the execution engine that will verify everything and validate, uh, but it will be like a default low value one. Uh, but for the actual block construction, very often they'll uh, just redirect it to someone who can who can do that better uh, because they can find MEV. Like so, solo validators will have really, really limited ability to extract MEV, which we see may end up being like 70% additional revenue. Uh, so if we don't allow this coin base to be overwritten, then obviously maybe it protects the solo validators in a way that they for sure will get the, uh, the transaction fees. But on the other hand, the block executors, like the block builders may be less likely to, um, to provide any significant value because the, the base fee after the burning, the coin base from transaction fee is not that relevant. And it, and it limits slightly the market, makes it much more rigid. Um, is Coinbase overridden? Go on. 
I might be healthier to, to allow this to be overridden because it creates like this multiple execution engines that compete, but also validate each other and, and creates a bit more healthy market with different, like you can have liquid staking, you can have big validators, uh, small MEV runners and all of like talking to different validators saying, this is what I can propose you, but I assume that you're running something to verify if I'm running the correct thing, because otherwise you might be uh, not voted on, not attested. And this would be a big loss for you. Um, I'll stop here on the Coinbase discussion. So do we have like a legit case when we, uh, when the Coinbase might be overridden um, by the execution client or not? I'm not seeing it yet because I think that the way that MEV is extracted is and in, in, in an open market doesn't need to override Coinbase, but I'm also probably speaking beyond my understanding at that point. And I don't know if we're going to solve that at this call. I would say the proof of custody takes out most of the cases I can imagine it being useful. Um, so I don't think it matters. I think there's much. still, I think there's still lots of cases, but I agree that we should probably move this to discord. Yep. Okay, so if we have the Coinbase here, it implies that it will need to be um, like an, it will need to be added to the validator um, client API as well. So this is for, to consider for uh, consistent client implementers uh, as well. So let's move forward. Um, we have the these two methods. Um, yeah, really, really yeah, quick, sorry, yeah, Miguel. Uh, did we decide before we got distracted with the Coinbase stuff? Did we get decide on switching that first method up to a um, prepare and get? So consensus engine would call prepare and then okay, sorry, I missed that. Yeah, yeah I th I think we we have a rough consensus around this, uh, uh, unless anyone yeah. is opposed to that. Okay, so yeah, execute payload and consensus validated which have, might have an alternative name. I personally don't like this much, uh, this one much. Uh, so, yeah, uh, what, 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 what's here, what's about these methods? Uh, obviously, uh, we have the payload to execute and verify by the execution client. And we, and we have a beacon block to be verified uh, by the beacon node, um, by the consensus client. And, uh, um, it doesn't make any sense. And the, the payload, even if it's a valid one, uh, but the consensus, uh, the, the beacon block is not valid, uh, this payload might, must be discarded. Uh, uh, this is why uh, uh, the second method appears here. Uh, like the other option would be by sending the, by calling the execute payload uh, only after the consensus client has validated the beacon block and uh, proves the proof that it's valid, but uh, it restricts the parallel, parallel, parallelizability uh, that we uh, want to leverage. Uh, the uh, like meaning the parallel processing of the execution payload and the beacon block to save us uh, some time. Uh, Hence, we need these two methods. And uh, yeah, there is like the uh, block persistent flow, the sequence diagrams that illustrates how uh, two different cases of how these uh, two methods are combined. Um, it also implies the cache in on the execution client side, which is mentioned like, uh, like in the bottom of this document. Um, like uh, the execution payload will have to be cached, uh, uh, will have to be stored in some place until the consensus validated message received and uh, it can be easily discarded or uh, persisted. Um, for like, I don't think any specific thing to mention here, ex uh, instead of this, uh, like uh, that, uh, this uh, consensus validated method maps on the proof state consensus validated event uh, from the CAP uh, 3675. Um, and uh, yeah, there is the enumeration of it, it just returns valid or invalid. I don't think, uh, I don't know if known is uh, valuable here. Probably not. 
and same here it's just propagates that this uh, the execution payload with this block hash uh, the consensus uh, uh, rule set has been validated and it's either valid or invalid because so that's the these two methods uh, the meaning of these two methods uh, it, does anybody have any questions here i think it's pretty straightforward but maybe and just just to make sure I understand. So the execute payload will come in when the consensus en engine is saying, "Hey, here's a block." Um, uh, yeah, let's go. Let, let's go here. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. Block arrives. Uh, the execution payload is sent, and uh, the consensus client starts to validate the beacon block. In the meantime, when it's validated, it sends consensus validated. So then the um, execution client responds, and after all this done. The block may be persisted or just or should be discarded. There is another case when the execution when the consensus validated comes after the uh, the payload has been has been validated, which is I don't think it's like potentially like the um, frequent case. Um, it's, it's, uh, probably when the execution payload is completely empty and no transactions that might happen. But anyway, it should be considered. So that's the flow. Uh, what what does an execution client need to do to recognize that um, the consensus validated will never come? Mm, uh, good question. Uh, you mean that when it should like drop the cache some, or? Yeah, at some point the so the execution client receives executed payload. It starts validating a block. At some point, I'm assuming it should throw that block away if it never receives a follow up consensus validated. Is that is that true? Right. Or should I hold on right. to it forever? Right. It may wait for a finalized block event and drop the cache. Um, yeah, probably not actually. If, if the okay, so if, if yeah, if if the payload is behind the uh, checkpoint that has been finalized, behind the block that has been finalized, it should drop. It should clear the cache, so it should prune the cache in this case. Okay, so so hold blocks until fi finalization, and then once finalization occurs, clear everything that's not in the finalized history, but is prior to it in terms of slot numbers. Right, and there is another possible case um, when it could be cleared up if the consensus uh, client uh, was out. But yeah, that's uh, that's related to the recovery of the failures and. There, there will be an explicit uh, uh, place where uh, the execution client understand that consensus client has been out if we follow the proposal uh, in this document. And in this case, it, it can also uh, release the cache. Um, like what was cached before doesn't matter anymore because consensus just, client just started and will uh, drop uh, like new information, like fresh information. So that's two possible cases for um, flushing this cache, for dropping this cache. Um, okay. Yeah, we have like 10 minutes uh, anyway. Um, yeah, the fork choice updated method, it unifies the two uh, previous methods that we have uh, on the fork choice uh, state updates which is finalized block and set head. Um, the reason behind this, um, to, behind this unification is that the fork choice uh, information, uh, namely the finalized block and the head uh, must be updated uh, atomically, must be applied atomically to the block store to avoid the corner case, uh, which is rare, but it, it's, it, it can appear and it's uh, legit. Uh, the corner case uh, is about the situation when the like the new finalized block uh, will be on a different uh, fork than the previous finalized block, and the message to finalized block arrives to the execution client, and it should update this finalized uh, finalized checkpoint, and it will update it. But uh, after this update, uh, the head and the finalized checkpoint will be on different branches. Which is in, uh, which is the um, lack of consistency between the two, and uh, yeah, of course, set head uh, that will update uh, the head to the new uh, to this new fork will arrive like 
in a, in a few milliseconds. But anyway, uh, there will be like a point of uh, there will be a short period of time uh, when these two uh, two two blocks two 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 things are uh, inconsistent. So that's why it needs to be um, like the atomic update of the head and finalized block. So uh, the reason. Yeah, I just want to note that uh, given the discussions led by Donkrid and and um, maybe the definition of what is unsafe head, so the most eager head than safe head, which often would map to the same thing, maybe with a little bit of delay, and then also finalize. Um, I think that this would be the method where we'd actually want to insert that information. Um, those three things would always be on the same chain. Uh, but if we do want to expose that additional information to the execution engine for the uh, user APIs that we discussed, the, I think this is where we would insert it. Um, I would not the... propagate this information to the execution client, rather would uh, request it like from two sources. This is just my opinion. We've been discussing it a bit in this group. Uh, just uh, the head block hash in this current draft, that would be equivalent to what we've been talking about as the unsafe head. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, yeah, it will be unsafe head. Miguel, well, so you're, yeah. you're saying you'd want to route as a proxy through to the beacon node rather right. than giving the information? Right. Mm. So, because we might want to, uh, we might uh, want to expose some other information from consensus layer to to the user's API in the future. So it might be more, it should be more flexible. And if we propagate this, uh, this all the information that uh, the user need uh, to, uh, the, the user may request from the JSON RPC to the execution client. Uh, this kind of like every every time we add something new to the from uh, from the consensus layer to the user's API, uh, we will have to update both the consensus clients and the execution uh, yeah. clients yeah. as well. I'd argue not putting most of the consensus layer stuff into the user API and for them to be separate. And if you actually do want to leverage stuff from the beacon chain, run web3.beacon and ask for it directly. Um, I think this is an exceptional case because this is your know, maps to them understanding the head of the execution chain, essentially, and that it's relatively limited in the information and that the beacon chain is good at calculating it, but it might as well hand it off to the execution engine because it's relevant to it. But I obviously I think, I think we could debate this. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I see. I see. What... I think the important part here is for backwards compatibility, um, unless we want the thing that everybody currently calls latest to be the unsafe head. Um, we need to make sure the execution engine is aware of what the safe head is. And I think it sounds like most of us agree that the safe, safe head is the reasonable replacement for latest. And so the execution engine needs to know that in order to not break everything. But then what we don't the probably merge. agree on yet is whether uh, the API proxies through to the beacon chain or if uh, so that you can extend beacon chain functionality into the user API more easily, or if this is kind of an isolated case and you just pass the additional information and don't proxy the API through. So even if we did proxy, I think we still need to tell the execution engine what the safe head is. Like regardless of the decision of proxy or not proxy, the execution engine needs to know safe head so it can return something when users ask for latest. Marius, safe head is not finalized. That is under, you know, if you, if you, uh, assume the network is synchronous and you see sufficient attestations come in, you can quickly know that it is very, very unlikely to be reorged. Um, and that that's kind of what we're calling safe here. And that, but that you could also be in a position where the head of your fork choice has not had sufficient information come in and it's still the head, but it's not, you can't make like as concrete of a, you can't make as a probabilistically good of a decision. Yeah, so we we currently have the, the model that everything not finalized is unsafe for us. So we're not like I, I agree that it might be sure. might be uh, might be good to to publish a safe head um, to the user for the user facing APIs, but internally we will not um, right 
do anything with it basically and i yeah i wouldn't suggest you uh, the only thing that i would do with it is potentially um how you route it to the user apis Jason, I, you to see. I don't think that it has to yeah, do sure. with how you handle your data model or anything like that yeah for context this is when it, when a user through the json rpc api talking to an execution client using legacy apis only so they have not upgraded anything for the merge they say give me the latest block the execution engine needs to return them something and we need to decide is that the unsafe head is that the safe head or is that finalized uh, safe head I, I think is the best option here because it's very close to the tip but it's also very safe and whereas finalized is potentially pretty old and we don't want to give a user a block that's you know several minutes old and unsafe is unnecessarily risky to the user. Um, okay, so yeah, let me back to this. Uh, like, uh, I do see value in if we say that we propagate all this, this information to the folk choice, uh, like these uh, confirmations, information to the execution client, and you know, will not get back to this pattern or any other data. So that might be valuable and uh, it might be reasonable to do. Um, once and yeah. Um, also, this yeah, this unification requires the corresponding update in the thirty six seventy five because there are two um, like events uh, that this map maps on. So this this is like will be done soon. Um, yep. Um, yeah, we have like four minutes. Um, yeah, and there was. It would be great to talk about the scene, but I, I think we we have not we have not enough time for this. So I, I propose to reach out the GAT team uh, in Discord to talk about the sync offline, the requirements of the sync process on the um, on this API. Um, and what do you think about making a call? What is the better time for the next call? Is it like one week or two weeks uh, from 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 this? Um, so so we're, we're currently working on, on our part of the spec of what we think about uh, the sync, um, which guarantees we can provide. Um, and Felix is unfortunately not here today, but he's currently uh, writing down a new document with basically everything about the sync. Um, so I think in one week, we should be finished if if you you all have like time there i don't know um, yeah i would make a call uh like one week after if uh like using the same time slot so any other opinions on that oh prather fork okay I mean, we can use like half of all core devs or two thirds of all core devs to discuss the sync for the merge. Like we, and it's basic, it's not exactly one week and it's not exactly the same time, but um, it might be a good enough uh, place. If we can do this, that'd be awesome. Sure. Yeah. It's hard to see what's higher priority. Um, so. Yeah, uh, so I guess, yeah, just in terms of next steps, uh, Marius, like as soon as the get team has like a sync write up, just post it in the Alcord as agenda and we'll we'll uh, make sure to cover that first on the call next week. Yep, and uh, whatever time, whatever, uh, whatever time uh, period during the Alcord dev, so we'll have to go through, or we'll just try to do as much as we can, uh, like, I mean, just follow this uh, discussion there. Um, okay, I'm stop sharing. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. I was like expecting not reaching the end of the document today. And <laughs> my profession there. Thank you so much. Um, see you later. Cool. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Bye. Thanks everyone.